My name is Nora Mulready and I am the founder of the Unfinished Revolution Project. The Unfinished Revolution Project takes the form of a series of short films looking explicitly at issues that are contentious, difficult to talk about um, and have perhaps been shied away from by the political mainstream. To do this we've brought together politicians, journalists, academics, campaigners, people with work and life experience um, in relation to the different topics that we're talking about. Today's film is exploring uh, a very necessary topic, um, what is uh, centrist politics? What are the politics of the progressive centre? To talk about this today, I have with me uh, Chris Coughlin, who is a former diplomat and a founder of an NGO. I have Emily Benn, who is a former parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party. And I have Barbara Blake, who is a Labour councillor um, in London. So welcome, all of you, and thank you. What actually are the politics of the progressive centre? We hear an awful lot about, you know, how many people are centrist now and, and all the rest of it. What does that actually mean? What should it mean? I guess there are many different definitions of it or everybody's got their own definition in some way. But for me, being in the centre or progressive politics is really about being idealistic in your values and pragmatic in your methods. So I believe passionately in the equality of all people, whoever you are and where, where you're from. Um, but I founded an NGO in, in Africa because I believe in social justice on the basis of need, not nationality. But within that, we were pragmatic about how we would achieve social justice and we looked for the best ideas that we could find um, anywhere. It doesn't matter what part of the political spectrum, frankly, but if there's evidence that they work and they, they um, are more effective than anything else at achieving for opportunity for all people, we should adopt them and use them. So um, give us a, just because you mentioned your NGO, t tell us a bit about, because I think that might um, give an example of what the type of politics you're talking about. So the NGO, I founded an NGO called Grow Movement. Where that came from when I was, when I was uh, 18, I met a, a child in, in Mozambique who had lost his mother in, in the war, in the civil war there. And I felt a lot of empathy um, with him because I also lost my mother when I was a child and that gave me sort of bizarre burning desire to go and do something about it and I felt it was very unfair that um yeah as a child in Mozambique you had very little opportunity to, to do anything about that um and what we do at Grow Movement is we actually we train micro entrepreneurs in in Africa yeah. um over the phone over mobile phone using volunteers anywhere in the world um in fact from 60 different countries and that increases um their sales uh, their profits and that enables them to create jobs in their local communities. Right, so it's actually using business in order to generate social justice. Exactly. So okay. yeah, it's fair, very well, sort of hybrid between, um, I guess, NGO charity type solutions, mm -hmm. but also business as well. Emily, I think actually that's a that's a great place to start. So that marrying of um, political pragmatism and you know ideological uh, values based politics, often centrist. It's suggested that that you know we have. We have no values. That's the bit that, that's missing. What, Which is uh, that? ludicrous. I mean, uh, putting your values into practice surely is the ultimate aim. And if you're not able to do that, I'm not really sure what use your values and uh, principles are. Mm. Uh, fighting is great, but delivering <laughs> is something else. Um, the other thing I'd say about centrist, progressive politics, it also matters how you do politics. Um, because the type of political discourse that we find ourselves in when you are just pitting people off against another whatever issue it is there is a wedge mm. and you are determined to uh you know and even when i would be very sympathetic to a cause i do find sometimes the way it is done deliberately antagonistic to other people that's not how you bring people with you uh you know when i was a, a parliamentary candidate if i was knocking on a door and asking someone what their you know who they wanted to vote for and try and persuade them to vote for me if they had something that didn't sit well with me politically I wouldn't just immediately tell them well you're wrong you're stupid mm. you know you're just crazy you, you have to enter a dialogue with them and and you know I going back to the point about you know working with business I worked in investment banking for six years which is you know anathema to you know apparently left and progressive politics but a if you don't understand it you're not really going to understand how you can use it for the purposes that you mm. want to B, you have to learn how to you know work and engage with people that have very different interests, views, even sometimes values, they're actually, you know, people's values 
most people's values I don't think are that far away from each other. And the more you pit people off against each other, the harder it is to find any of the shared ground. So not only do we have to talk about what the actual policies and view of you know, progressive centrist politics, which has to be you know, uh, you know, economic efficiency married with giving everyone the opportunity to do well and a social enabling state that helps people get there, um, which is my kind of vision for what it's worth, um, you know, you have to you have to work with people along the way. Mm. That yes, I agree. You know, we have to keep our eye uh, as politicians and councillors on the wealth gap, the you know the the lives um, and the gap between rich and poor, and how poor people, you know, the the experience they have uh, of the services that we provide as local councillors. But but we also have to enable people to to be able to create their wealth, mm. to be able to have jobs and decent housing. And if, if someone, you know, wants to buy a house or a flat, I, I, we, we as the council and as, as, as a centrist government should be providing mm. those kind of opportunities. So actually it's kind of reconceptualising. I mean, in a way, the, the, the kind of emergence of the concept of a progressive centre is, is allowing us to reconceptualise some of these issues. So, for example, if you're looking at um, uh, housing provision, you know, should councils only be providing council housing or should they be looking at, uh, you know, lots of different types of housing? I, I, I wholly support councils building more, more properties, mm. but do we want um, the big, huge council estates that were built um, in the 40s, 50s and 60s? Do, or, do we, or do we want um, can, uh, estates that have mixed tenure? That you have a mixture uh, of residents, that you that there are opportunities there, you know, for people to have um, to 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 rent somewhere, or to have a social housing, or to buy to something, buy or to, to buy something. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think we need that debate with councils and with the government mm. about yes, I I absolutely support councils building more houses, but what kind kind of houses and what kind mm. of estates do we want mm. them to be? One of the key things for me about progressive centrist politics is you need to go around the country and you need to be saying right what what industry will work here what is the what is the survivable um uh, you know local economy here how can you make sure you know you go around to different parts of the country and they have been so abandoned you know there, there's, there's such high welfare bills in these places because people don't have jobs you know people will become ill there are serious mental health issues you know etc etc it, and it's and it's like there's just uh, there is an abandonment and you feel it's palpable yeah. when 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 you go around the country and you see them and you I see think, these places. I think um, yeah, part of the problem with centrism is that uh, some of the Blair years was those were the good times, um, mm. and so it's easy to be pragmatic um, when there's a low cost of voters because you don't have to say you need to put up taxes to fund any of this. Whereas where we are today, um, we're actually facing, I think. A, you know, a series of catastrophic risks over the next few decades, obviously, which obviously the left behind is, is, is a key one, but also climate change um, and you know, the world's looking a lot more dangerous. And that, to, to, to try and address some of these issues, yes, you can come up with some clever uh, market-based solutions to some of them, but ultimately it's going to cost more money um, than than say during 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 the Blair mm. years, simply because the economy was larger and there was more economic mm. growth back then. And so, so people need to be prepared to make the argument. People make, and the both to the left to, and the right yeah. and, um, in different ways. And so we're in, I think we're in a different paradigm now to mm. where we were then. And you know, if you take climate change for example. Um, the um, UN panel on climate change found that I think we need to cut emissions globally by I think 45 percent by 2030 which is just never going to happen on current, mm -hmm. current levels of um, willingness of countries to act for that. So if, if we're to avoid that, the UK should be putting huge amounts of effort into decarbonising, which incidentally involves creating a whole load of new industries that we would be great in left behind areas anyway. But to have the political will and as a country to, to be prepared to make the sacrifice for that, it's not that different in my view, unfortunately, to um, part of the, well, during the First and Second World Wars in terms of during the Second World War, First and Second World Wars, we went through, um, society went through a profound level of change because the rich acknowledged that there was a war on that was threatening 
um, vitally threatening us as a country. And they made huge financial sacrifices, and they accept that as part of being patriotism. Now, we're not in that extreme situation right now, but um, we do need a level of sacrifice to our country as a whole, financial sacrifice, to put things back on the, on the right track and decarbonise. Mm. Um, the, uh, the point you made about, you know, what industries... Uh, you know, the other thing we haven't mentioned now is that you know the nature of our workforce is changing because of automation, which is only mm -hmm. going one way, and mm -hmm. no one's talked about that. And yeah. this, there's a, there's a, you know, there's got to be a great progressive argument as to how you tax changes to take in account for this. But you know, your, your father was a, a, you know, worked in the post office. You look in America, the number of people working in the post office has fallen by a million and a half because mm. of automation. Mm. So. Yeah. Uh, a dialogue um, with communities about cultural sensitivities mm. that for too long people were too worried about. To Give us an example talk. of that. Um, if I think about like the first time I was a parliamentary candidate, we didn't really talk about immigration in mm. at all, really, in that first campaign that I was three years candidate, mm. 2007, 2010, and then by 2015, because you hadn't, and then you have a Conservative government that makes this magic target about 100,000, which is, by the way, part of the a completely a great example of just stupid policy because. A, you can't really... You, they knew they couldn't have been met. So mm. all you do is make people distrustful and mm. less likely so to believe. You make promises. Fulfilled. I mean, yeah. utterly ridiculous. And then also people... A lot of people think, well, then that's the number that we've got to get to without thinking about the other reasons of the mm. people that you're not getting and you know the, the needs of the economy and the needs of our public services, etc. So I, I, I saw that so much after that mm. promise was made and by the time I was a candidate the second time. But we hadn't had any discussion about it otherwise, so then people were wedded to this mm. 100,000. So that's a... A first start, first example. Part of the problem is, you know, you have a Conservative manifesto commitment in 2017 about long-term social care. Now, you can argue that it was wrong in many ways, which I would, but, you know, you're immediately pounced on, um, and then that completely shuts down debate about the issue. Mm. Since the financial crash in 2007, um, the gap, I, I mean, people, people saw it, and it was sold, certainly by the left, that it was these greedy bankers that were milking the system and, and, well, it was that, and secondly, that it was, it was the previous Labour government that had spent all the money mm. um, on providing all these, all these services. Mm. Um, and we on the left never really, I mean, we used the, the bankers as the whipping post mm. because of the crash and we never really addressed the issue that it, wasn't a, it was a crisis of capitalism. It wasn't actually the fact that Labour had spent had, had overspent on, on, on public services. So people should have come out a bit more strongly and defending Labour's Should have come, out, have come out stronger and defended um, the, the previous Labour government and, and its record. What would, you, what would your take be on that? Uh, well, massively, because when you got to the 2015, you know, I saw that as a candidate. By the time I got to 2015, no one had really been defending the previous Labour mm. government at all, and not that I would argue that the leadership in that interim five years didn't really do it either mm. hard to campaign on your record if you've been trashing it yourself do you feel like we're getting closer to that kind of idea or with the rise of kind of political populism extremism etc are we are we moving further away from it are we losing this 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 battle i mean it's a great question the i think that centrism has been or a lot of people perceive it as being discredited or that it's failed yeah. in, in, in recent years. Um, and that's driven people to, I guess, in their, in their anger and their frustration with a lack of opportunity to the hard left or to... Um, the the guess, rise of the far right. Yeah, the yeah. rise of the far right or the hard, or, or, um, you know, hard Brexiters, for example. There's a nationalism sort of starting to, to come back. I think we need to have a lot of humility that actually in, in sort of some of our sort of passion for being internationalist and cosmopolitan, um, I think we've neglected the left behind um, in, in our own country. So who do you mean by the left behind? Do, do, let's define so, that a so, the, so really simply, the, um, you know, since 2002, uh, the British economy is a third larger, but wages are the same. Mm. And so... Uh, you know, the average person in the UK hasn't seen a, a pay rise for 17 years, yet people, highly skilled people living in cities, have seen their incomes soar. And so, you know, the majority of the country actually haven't, haven't experienced the fruits of, of economic growth. And, you know, because I think we've sort of been fixated on our internationalism or, you know, we've, we've forgotten what 
our own communities. When you say internationalism, are you looking at things? What are you talking about? Are you talking about free movement? Are you talking about? Yeah. What, so what, I think. What, so what I think it's about? yeah. So um, free movement, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you believe in the equality of all people, like I do, it seems natural to support the idea of free movement. But it. But it. But then it. Yeah. I think we've neglected the costs of immigration in terms of communities that have had their you know, had in, of sort of low skilled workers that have experienced decline in or decline in their wages because they've got um, low uh, people willing to work for low wages coming in and, and uh, competing with them um, and it's quite uncomfortable although it seems against your values to, to oppose that as, mm. a, as an internationalist um, actually I think people have got a point around that um, well particularly if you're looking at places and emily you you probably can articulate this a, a, a bit more but especially when you're looking at places around the country where you 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 can see that actually the the, the investment in education you know it didn't didn't really reap great rewards for, for for those communities you know industries were closed jobs weren't replaced you know when you're looking at people who've become quite disempowered communities of become you know both economically and socially and culturally disenfranchised you can see where a lot of the um, tensions are coming from i look in nottingham um at the working class communities that that used to have um i mean uh, uh, working coal mines mm. uh, edwinstow around there that that were nice places to live that had pits that have all closed down um and and, and people... but would you 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 i mean would you advocate you know, reopening the pits. No, 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 no I wouldn't. So this but, is, and I suppose this but, is the point about the, the, the where, where does the progressive centre yeah. sit? Because I certainly would not support any movement no. that suggested we send human beings back down in, in, no, into no. mines. And I, I know but, you wouldn't either. No, I wouldn't. But, so but, what's the solution? But people then um, earned, I mean, certainly from the 70s onwards, mm. and I mean, we, we can have a long talk about the miners' strikes mm. and everything, and the Nottinghamshire miners, but certainly from the 70s onwards, people who lived in those villages were starting to earn a reasonable wage. Mm. My dad was a postman, but he was, he, was a, he was a civil servant, he had a secure job, you know, he, he could work overtime, there was plenty of overtime. And my dad had a saying, my dad used to say, I want to earn enough to pay my rent, have a few pints at the weekend. I don't want a penny more or a penny less. Oh, and to take my, my family to Skegness or Mablethorpe for a two weeks holiday. Now, that, that was what my father wanted. He wanted enough, enough to live on um, and to have a bit of comfort once a, once a year. And, and I, th I think and that I resonates. Think, yeah. And yeah. I think that resonates because that, I think that has gone. Yeah. Um, and as you say, we, we, we talk about in work poverty yeah. But if you look at the traditional working class communities who, who feel that Labour has let them down, who feel that Labour no longer represents them, which is why we've seen, we've seen the drift, I think is firstly because when we've had things like the financial crash, those communities have never had, had a voice, but they're the people who know that, that they've suffered. Mm. They're the ones who've yeah. seen their standard of living go down now you know let me bring chris in okay. i mean the, the interesting thing with, with, with that is ex exactly that they're, they're uh, people like your, your father in those communities they're the people who have been the losers from globalization mm. and um there's almost a certain irony that i guess many cosmopolitan or met metropolitan liberal elite always look down for being you know, the anti-immigrants or the nationalists mm. today um whereas actually these are the people who, who've lost out and i think whenever you're talking about globalization you need to mention because they've lost out, that's also meant that hundreds of millions of people in developing countries have escaped mm. from poverty. Um, so globalization actually been massively mm. beneficial overall. Um, but similarly, the, the, uh, the high earning, high skilled labor force, who've also been massive winners, haven't acknowledged that cost. And in terms of what you do about it, um, it comes back to being pragmatic because a lot of um, Traditional liberalism is all about free markets, and mm. actually, all the evidence shows that people like those communities have lost out from it. And actually, there are spaces for more state-led mm. mm. intervention to address those types of issues. And it's not true that countries have never got um, rich through through state-led intervention. Mm. Um, absolutely, when you when you look at advanced uh, economies, actually like the UK as a whole or the US, 
you generally need free market um, principles to, to generate economic growth, right with the sort of high-tech industries, because the state isn't equipped to have knowledge of how they can adapt fast enough. But with more simpler technologies or technologies in place elsewhere, you can actually use a state-led approach. So South Korea went, um, went from having a GDP per head similar to Ghana um, in the 50s to being one of the richest countries in the world through a state-led national champions approach. They basically um, looked at what was happening elsewhere and it used the state to create clusters and uh, support state-led industries to, to adapt that. And we could use a similar approach in left behind the areas. And if you look at somewhere like Tottenham, uh, which is a wonderful, which is a wonderful borough, but that has high levels of worklessness, um, higher than I think the London and, and national average. Even when times are good, right. it still has high levels of unemployment. Now these are the issues I think that certainly um, a local council. Has to, has to address that, that we need to look at that and we need to get underneath the reasons. We need to understand why there are pockets of, of the country where there are high levels of mental health, where there are high levels of diabetes. I worked in banking and you know, I am so passionately uh, you know, of the view that shareholder va value maximisation, which is this view that the, you know, the rewards have to go to shareholders at all costs. That means that workers are to be reduced as much as possible. Their benefits are to be cut to the bone. You try every trick as you can to just valueize your bottom line with no care about the cost of the communities um, has, has had tremendously negative impacts mm -hmm. for communities. But who's talking about that? When, when you say have, have had negative effect on the communities, can you just explain to... to, to so, to you know, if you're, if, you're a company, if you're a company that's... If, if you are a public company and you've got shareholders, yeah. at the moment, the market rewards you. And because if you're a... If CEOs are paid by share price movements, right? So you are massively incentivized to do things that will get your share price up quickly at, at any cost, really. And if you present results every three or six or nine months. You know, Chris worked in finance too. You know, everyone cares about the results every three months. It's a ridiculous short-term culture. Mm. I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. So you're saying that, that that kind of stops people from really taking long-term long -term views, views of investing communities, communities exactly. etc. Exactly. Let's cut workers here or let's do what some companies do, which is you build a, a, a warehouse which is supposed to create these new jobs. They are incredibly low paid. They are invariably by a third-party outsourced wholesale outsourcing with no opportunities yeah. for advancement. If you want to have a, a functioning society, um, the, the higher paid need to acknowledge that they have a, an obligation to the lower paid in the country to try and put the, the social balance better. And, and if inequality is fine in a country, I believe, um, provided everyone's getting better off mm -hmm. over the long run. And that manifested, well, it hasn't happened for, mm -hmm. for, for 17 years. And I think because of that, fundamentally, that's why centrism or liberalism has failed. We need a reformed liberalism. We need to acknowledge that the mm. sort of free market model has failed, which completely free market model, obviously it failed in the, in the financial crash, but I think I'd go further, um, coming back to what Emily has said, in terms of our whole attitude, in terms of social responsibility, it needs to be at the core of what we do. The progressive centre should be at the forefront of these type of things, but politics hasn't caught up to what the real issues and the real mm. divides are. talk about trade union background you know trade unions now really I think should be helping people get on at work and mm. training and mm. skills and given that everyone's going to have to have so many different <coughs> careers in our you know in our new aging population you're not, you're not going to do the same job for 50 years anymore. I think they're a great example of an institution that perhaps hasn't found its 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 place in in you know modern modern society should what should the role of trade unions be should they have a role you know should they be phased out or should they have a bigger role? What's your take on that? Well, absolutely. Trade unions, I think, do have still a very big role in, in people's working, working lives. Do have or should have? Well, do have and should have. Okay. I don't think... I do feel that trade unions are not very good um, at actually getting out into the community. Um, uh, uh, mostly trade unions now, more or less... Um, are, are, are active within the public sector mm. but have found it difficult to, to, to go out into the private sector. And there's absolutely no reason 
I mean, somebody who works in the financial sector, they should know the benefits of joining a trade union and know why it's important to be a member of a trade union. And we need to do much more work um, um, around that, about, about making trade unions, I think, much more inclusive and, much, but, and, and open for, for people to join. I think, as I've said, people, uh, trade unions should be out in the community. Um, uh, people who, don't, who, do, who do work but aren't a member of a trade union, perhaps because there's no trade union in their workplace, uh, and it's quite, difficult to, uh, it's quite difficult for people to know where to go um, if you work somewhere where you don't have an active trade union, mm. but probably still need help and advice and support um, when, when there, there are difficulties. So I do think that, that there is a role. I think we critically need a, a long-term vision for mm. the country. Um, I don't think anybody's really talking about that in any serious way in politics right now. There's, mm. a, there's a sort of obsession with, with the short term, um, and that's fine during the good times, but we're in a very serious crisis, well, multiple crises mm. as a country, in fact, as a world at the moment. Um, so there's a desperate need for, for leadership and, 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 sadly, frankly, sacrifice as well to um, start addressing the long-term challenges that we face we simply aren't. Emily? Uh, be proud of the achievements made to date. Don't let people seduce you, the nostalgia that you know, over you know, blindfolds you to actually some of the reality of it. A relentless focus on the future. And, you know, how many issues have we talked about that prog the Progressive Centre should be at the forefront of discussing, but no one is talking about them? So talk about the issues. And I wish, you know, my God, I'm not saying that I have any of the answers, but I hope that we can at least start asking the right questions and come up with them because, you know, most people don't spend all their time worrying about the Progressive Centre uh, <laughs> up in our Britain, nor should they. I'd be concerned if they did. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are, do think about how, what's going to go on in the future and their kids. And these are the type of issues that we should be confident in talking about uh, with our values and not be afraid to try and have a rational debate and hope that in the mm. end... Other people come to the same conclusion too. Barbara? Well, I agree with everything that's, <laughs> that's been said. Having the vision, I think having the conversation, I think getting out and, and, and talking to people yeah. and getting yeah. people involved and mm. being excited. I, I can remember, you know, all my life, there have been times in that, or a lot of times when I've been very excited Mm. about about you know policies that have come or i've i've listened to a, a marvelous speech and i've been inspired by that we seem to have lost that mm. and and i think that we we just need to yes we need to have the vision but we need to have the conversation with people as well wonderful thank you all very much for taking part in the unfinished revolution project Thanks. thank you Nora. Thank you.